When Switzerland's biggest bank was first caught helping some of its wealthiest clients evade taxes in France, Stephanie Gibault thought her former employer would be punished severely. A UBS employee turned whistleblower, Gibault's evidence was crucial to the conviction. In 2008, she refused to follow orders from her superiors to delete all of her company files. Her documents would later help French investigators identify 38,000 offshore bank accounts, amounting to $12 billion. But it has been an arduous journey, coming at a massive personal sacrifice for Gibault, whose life was turned upside down. This past November, the French Supreme Court upheld a criminal conviction against UBS for money laundering and promoting illegal banking services. But in a small win for the Swiss lender, the court has allowed it to continue its fight to substantially reduce the fines it needs to pay, something it has already done successfully before. Gibault is not surprised that the bank lives to fight another day. Just how steep is the cost of blowing the whistle against the most powerful? Stephanie Gibault talks to the interview. She is the woman who knew too much. Stephanie Gibault joins us now on the interview. I thank you very much for joining us. We speak not long after UBS gets another chance to take that big fine that was 4.5 billion euro, which went down to 1.8 billion euro. And now there's the possibility that it would be, it could be far less than that even. How do you feel about it? Well, uh, good evening first, and thank you for having me with you. Well, um, I have exactly the same analysis. It seems to me and to many people in France whom I talk today that, uh, yeah, it will be reduced to much less than 1.8 uh, uh, billion uh, euros. Uh, we will see. Uh, Court of Appeal will then decide. Uh, mm. You know, it's... Yeah, as you said, it's steps. Yeah. And getting and, lower and lower. I mean, is there even a number that would be fair and would be just? Well, if I uh, speak in the words of the bank, UBS had said back 10 years ago that HSBC had paid 300 million euros in France and UBS had to pay 300 million euros in Germany. So somehow they said it's the market price. Hmm. So is UBS deciding of the market price for the justice? I do not know. Should ask the judges and the French justice. Does this win for them on appeal signal to the world just how powerful they are and how powerful they can argue their case? Well, uh, this is the whole problem with the finance industry is that the banks are much more powerful than our states. And it shows, you know, in the length of the procedure and in, um, in, in, in the debates that have been taking place for more than 10 years. What, what is extremely interesting is that banks never consider that they do things wrong. Uh, they just do business, you know, and... Uh, because UBS, in my case, is the wealth manager I was uh, working for. It's the biggest wealth management bank in the world, the oldest one in the in the world. And because it manages so many um, portfolios of uh, extremely wealthy people, obviously they have the means to defend themselves and to defend the client's interests. Mm. And uh, obviously, when your state are fighting this. Uh, either you have to have determination, but uh, the state's uh, politicians also are concerned by those files. So, you know, it's a very tricky balance for everybody. Mm. On one side, you have the politicians saying they uh, fight uh, tax evasion. And on the other side, we have the results and we have, you know, well, what happened today. Mm. Uh, it's extremely difficult. You have words, lots of words. 
you uh, here in Europe, every state, every head of state and the European Parliament, everyone talks about uh, fighting, tax evasion, etc. And we have um, tax paradises within the EU. You know, yesterday there were the Cyprus files um, um, being made public all over the world. And we know it's another story of money laundering, etc. So it, it never ends. So mm. obviously they are so powerful. Yeah, you know, it does. Mm, so it does seem as if there is, there's regulation, there are laws, there are words, as you put it, that are said by politicians, by regulators and others to say that we don't want there to be tax evasion. We don't want the super rich to be protected. And yet they are. So let us rewind, go back more than 15 years. You had what for many could be deemed a dream job. You were giving or selling experiences to very rich clients. Uh, taking them to the World Cup final, uh, taking them on yachts and, and, and so on. Paint that picture for me very briefly. Tell me about that job and tell me how things turned. Uh, at UBS, I was the head of marketing and communication in France and uh, in each country in the world where UBS operates, you had a woman uh, doing the same kind of job as I did, which is entertaining the wealthy clients and uh, potential prospects, because obviously you work on clients and potential clients. And the big um, complicated thing was that as they can buy everything, we had to offer them stuff that money cannot buy. So the very complicated thing was to try and find ideas to offer them emotions. So my job was to provide uh, VIP events. Yeah, you were talking about uh, rugby, World Cup final, football, World Cup final, you know, tickets in a box, um, tennis tournaments, uh, cruises, uh, opera premieres, whatever could, uh, uh, make the client dream. So obviously, you know what their hobbies are. U UBS, for example, had created the very famous uh, UBS golf trophy, which was the most famous golf trophy all over the world. And uh, all the ones who were participating were explaining that, you know, it was uh, extremely, it was extraordinary. Mm. So this is what I did during 10 years. So I was uh, running from one place to another, organizing about 100 events a year. So, you know, it's one every three days or four days. It, it's a lot. I, I was, um, yeah, very busy. I loved my job. It was a passion. And uh, I was very happy to serve um, the clients and to serve my employer. Did you suspect that built into that relationship with the super wealthy was an understanding that UBS would possibly help hide some of their assets and money from tax authorities? Or was it only at that moment that your boss told you to delete your files that you suspected something was fishy? I worked for UBS uh, almost 10 years before I was asked to delete those uh, documents. I was working for UBS France, so I was working mostly for French clients, sometimes for foreigners who are living here, or it could be, you know, here and there are a couple of foreigners, but mostly for French clients living in France. And my job was to take care of them here. Obviously, we had Swiss people, um, you know, Swiss people from marketing and Swiss bankers all the time. But I was working for the president and for the general manager. And uh, each of them were repeating to the staff all the time that we were following the French rules and the French re regulations. So um, how could I question the word of my president and general manager? I was working all the time. I was never in the office. And I was not someone um, involved in the figures, involved in the amounts of uh, uh, the bank accounts. I was uh, operational. So I had a job, I had a mission, which was to make sure that clients would stay with the bank instead of going to another bank, to a competitor. So like anyone in a company, I had to do my job. And what I discovered when I was asked 
to delete those files because first I thought that the problem was me. Mm. I was like, it's as if they want to get rid of me. What's wrong with me? Did I make a mistake? I, I did not understand. And because I didn't delete those files, a terrible story started, which is that I started being harassed and isolated and I was not traveling anymore. I mean, a very strange, uh, um, very bizarre changes that I could not understand. And because the bank was suffering in the United States, um, procedures, internal procedures starting to change. And we did not have Swiss bankers allowed to come to France. We didn't have Swiss bankers allowed to come to the office anymore. So I started to talk to some of the bankers who were fired. And they started explaining to me things here and there. And I was like, but how come? Would it be possible that there would be problems knowing that we refer to the French authorities and that uh, we have auditors, external auditors, internal auditors, people would have seen if something was wrong. And this is where I was absolutely wrong. So I pulled a, thre a, a thread, you know? Yeah. And the more I pulled, the more I discovered the nightmarish um, situation I was in. And somehow the nightmarish um, company had been working for. So the first person I was angry at was myself. Mm. I was like, but how come didn't I see anything? How come didn't I suspect anything? And it is because one of the senior bankers was fired from the bank that he wanted to see me. And I met him several times, and this person, who was a senior person, it was someone really honest and faithful, and he explained to me how it worked. And namely, he talked to me about something I'd never heard before, which was, in French, it was le carnet du lait, which, which is what? It was a little notebook where uh, the general manager was writing every month with a pencil, hmm. the, the amount that was evading taxes to Switzerland. And I was like, but what are you talking to me about? It's as if we're in a yeah. you know, very strange dark movie. And he explained to me that at the end of the month and at the end of the year, this was allowing the bankers in Switzerland and in France to um, negotiate their bonuses. Right. Because in February, every year uh, in, in, in banks, you have the bonuses being distributed. And you're like, okay, I cannot believe what you're telling me because UBS is the oldest bank in the world. It's the biggest bank in the world. It's the bank of all the, what we call the PEP, the politically exposed people. It can't be possible that, you know, stuff are being written uh, manually with a pencil in, in a notebook. What are you talking to me about? And he explained to me uh, for, uh, you know, uh, a couple of weeks what it was about. And he said to me, Stephanie, your events are made somehow to fish people. And when they want to open uh, offshore accounts, they can do it. Yeah. And I said, OK, but Swiss people are here. They have always been here. If they were not allowed to be in France, why wouldn't uh, custom officers do something? Why wouldn't the authorities do anything, the regulators? And he said, this is the big question. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, but we have auditors, internal auditors, external auditors. What do they do? And he said, this senior manager said, well, I just talked to the auditor about that, saying that he must do something about it. But he explained that somehow my job was central to that. So for me, it was the worst to swallow, the worst to digest, because I came home with a burden. I was the mother of two children raising my kids alone. I was like, how come was I in the middle of a terrible thing without seeing it? Hmm. Obviously, I couldn't see it because I didn't know. Obviously, you don't know anything about the transactions. All that is extremely secret. You know, a bank is like a submarine. You have compartments everywhere. So you don't even know what the people working next door do. 
and you start understanding the organization and you start to understand the culture of silence and you start to understand, as I said before, I pulled a string. I would never have thought that me as a marketing person and somehow, you know, I was just entertaining people, obviously for business, but I couldn't imagine that it was hiding hmm. something as bad as that. So all the pressures I suffered, they somehow had a meaning. They had to destroy me because I knew too much, as you said, when right. we started uh, and, and you say that, I mean, it's interesting because in, initially, if you don't want to destroy the documents, you're saying no, that's insubordination, but you still have not become a whistleblower, you still haven't gone public. And you're pulling that thread, pulling that thread, speaking to the auditors and speaking to the experts, hitting this point of moral crisis, saying something is terribly wrong. Given your experiences in the initial years after not wanting to delete your files, seeing how they treated you, you knew that if you went public, it's going to be infinitely worse. Why did you still do it? Oh, somehow it's much more complicated than that. I am not like Edward Snowden who came public, you know, meeting mm. journalists and saying this happened and this happened. In my case, the story became public and somehow my name was leaked. Mm. And the question still remains today. Why was my name leaked? And somehow all the journalist, namely in France, but internationally, because the UBS case is not only French. I met uh, other um, investigators from different countries after my uh, story became public. So uh, going public is what creates the damage in your life as a whistleblower. But you could still uh, have you 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 could still have retreated into the safe cocoon of UBS and said, "Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, can you maybe defend me?" I'm a part of the team now, my name's out in the public, I'm a part of the family again. They probably would have taken you back. Why did you not? Well, first, they never proposed that to me because they crushed me almost to death. You know, I went through a depression. I was uh, mm. not even able to stand on my legs anymore. It has been a very, very difficult thing with the bank. So I was living in a state of fear. So... What do you do when you are in a state of fear? What do you do when you are a single mother with two children? What do you do when you are so isolated? In the bank, you know, I had 500 colleagues. All of them were in the same state. Saying, what's going on? We are, there are searches in the bank. So what are they looking for? You don't even know. It's extremely stressful situation. It's stuff that are quite hard to understand when you haven't gone through them. Mm. It was the first time in my life I was living something like this, and I hope I will never have to suffer it again. Yeah. You need somehow to have the experience to understand what's going on. But when you don't understand what the problem is, and somehow you think that your enemy is the employer you have served for so long, so who can be your friend? Right. Obviously your state, obviously the justice, and this is what I thought then, uh, and the media, because the media are here to make things public, to also start investigation, and to try and help the public to understand things that was hidden from them. So my perspective then, because I was in a really state of fear, was to try to explain to people what had happened to me and what this whole story was. Somehow I was screaming for help. Yeah. And uh, the thing is that it's not your perception as a person that matters. It's the way people will receive it and what your country, your justice, the media and all the stakeholders, the clients, obviously the bank, obviously their lawyers are going to do with it. And Stephanie, and so, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Sorry, sorry about that. I just want to ask you because you mentioned your country, you know, your state, your, your justice system. You've written to the, uh, the French prime minister talking about needing protection for whistleblowers. Why is it that after all these years, after all these battles, why is it that whistleblowers such as yourself, when it comes to revealing unpalatable things about tax evasion and other such activities, why are they not protected? We have understood that as long as the 
the whistleblowing, the alert, is not too big, somehow they can be managed very well. But as soon as it becomes an extremely, I mean, a systemic thing, obviously, uh, you, the countries do not protect anymore. It, it means that the laws are not um, are not made for this kind of uh, damages. It's too complicated. So on one side you have words and talks, ex and obviously political talks, and you have laws. France, for example, had passed a law in 2016 to fight corruption. Then, because we're France, country of human rights, uh, founder, mem founder member of Europe, we, our Euro deputies pushed for the European directive to protect whistleblowers. So now in the 27 European countries, you have laws. And the first one not to apply the law to me is France. Mm. Why? You know, it's extremely twisted. It really means that, obviously, it's hypocrite, obviously. Uh, obviously, it also sends a signal to others saying, well, if you dare talk, look at what will happen to you. Because if we open a parenthesis, there have been lots of financial scandals somehow 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And nowadays, why don't you have a single whistleblower in a bank anymore? But is that, is that to suggest that, is that the clearest indication to you that politicians are in bed with those with money. I mean, in the sense that you would think on the surface of things, if there's the opportunity to get money that was hidden, tax money that should be legitimately taxed off billionaires and multimillionaires, you'd think a country like France with high taxation would be very excited about that. Wouldn't they be excited about that? And this is what I also thought 10, 15 years ago. And nowadays, this is why I wonder if my enemy is UBS or if it's the French state, hmm. which states that it protects whistleblowers, that it f fights uh, tax evasion, that it also protects the people who work with the Ministry of Finances, which is my case. I've worked for them for more than a, uh, more than a year. And somehow it's the one that crashes you. So to go back to your question and politicians, well, they have been... Uh, lots of leaks this past uh, years, if you remember the Panama Papers, mm. Paradise Papers, etc., etc. You have lots of politicians from all over the world, all over the world. And uh, in France, for example, we had the Minister of uh, Budget, who was called Mr. Cahuzac, who was uh, minister when François Hollande, socialist, was uh, elected, was the president. And he was saying he was fighting tax evasion and the whole of the French population discovered that he had an offshore bank account in Switzerland. And it happened that his offshore bank account was with UBS. Right. And it happened that it was not as a private account, but it was as a politician account. And it was um, being financed by bribes, listen to me, by bribes from Pfizer. Pfizer, pharmaceutical company. And what was this money for? It was to finance French fi um, politi political parties. And you're like, this goes too far. Yeah. You know, if you were inventing a, a scenario for a movie, you would say, okay, you go too far. <laughs> yeah. But no, this is, this is extremely scary. And if you have the images of this guy saying at the Assemblée Nationale, so the French parliament, that he never had a bank account, that it's not true, that he will go to justice to prove that he is right. But lies are absolutely incredible. Those people are uh, actors, they are comedians, they are on stage, and they are here to deliver a message. They are not here to defend the citizens, they are here to protect their own interests. And this is what happened in France. But you can take many, many examples and the problem in France is that we know, I mean, people like me know that uh, other French politicians, but high-level French politicians, left-wing and right-wing, every political party is uh, involved, have mm. or had uh, UBS offshore accounts. And you are like, okay, somehow you fall in a trap, and what is going to happen? Because obviously those people are not in jail, the other clients 
who were cheating were not in jail. Uh, they are not being prosecuted. Uh, so what do you do? And the thing is that a voice like mine has been... <laughs> well, certainly and, not on this program. <laughs> no, but it's very kind of you, and uh, and and I really appreciate because this is the problem. There are talks, you know. You have this expression in English: either you talk the talk or you walk the walk. Mm. And the French media do not talk at all about that. Mm. You know, for example, they talked about this crazy story with the Minister of Budget with his account, offshore account, on one side, and on the other side, they talked about the UBS story. So right. for people who don't know, don't follow the things, obviously it doesn't make sense that it's a whole thing. And you were talking earlier about the wealthy client, but it's an ecosystem, you know. Mm. They all are together, if you say, they are in bed, as one says in English. You right. know, they're in bed together. They protect each other because obviously uh, when you create trust, uh, offshore structures, you do not have any any tracks nobody can can, right. can go and, and look for it uh, unfortunately we are out of time and there was so much more i wanted to talk to you about including ubs taking over credit suisse because they said there'd be a global <laughs> financial crisis if they don't but unfortunately we're out of time so maybe next time we can talk a bit more about that but listen i i really appreciate you taking the time i know this has been difficult for you for a long long time and i appreciate your candor your honesty and your willingness to, to talk about all of it. Thank you very much for joining us on the interview, Stephanie Gibault. Thank you very much for having me.